We'll go ahead and grab a seat. And just a reminder, at the end of the service this morning, we'll wrap up about 10 minutes early because the kids from Camp Compass will be sharing some of what they learned, a couple songs for us that they'll be doing after uh, the message this morning, after we wrap up. But have you ever been looking for something in the wrong place or assumed you knew where something important was? I mean, this happened to me just the other day with my wallet. I checked the normal spot before leaving. It wasn't there. So I assumed, oh, I must have just left it in the car. So I hop in the car and I start driving. And about the mile down the road, I look over at where I was expecting to see my wallet and it wasn't there. So then I check the glove box. I check the console. I turn the car around. I go back. I check the normal place again. I check the other places again. It's not there. Finally, I find it under a piece of paper on the desk, right? I was looking for it in the wrong places and assumed I knew where it was when I didn't. Well, one thing that people seem to be looking for a lot today are things like purpose and confidence. I mean, just go into any bookstore, if you can find a bookstore anymore, but go inside the ones that you can find and look at what books they display. Look at what books are selling. And you're going to find a lot of those books are trying to tell people, hey, here's how you can have purpose in your life. Hey, here's how you can be confident. Even really some of the best-selling Christian books. That's the idea behind them. But the problem is a lot of people are looking for purpose and looking for confidence in the wrong places, or assuming they know where those things come from when they don't. Because there's a lot of conversation out there about purpose, about confidence, uh, but I think if we actually look out at the world, there's actually not a lot of those things. And, And those are important things that I think a godly person will have. A godly person will have confidence and purpose, but where is the right place to look for those things? And that's the question we want to answer today, so I want to invite you to take your Bibles and open them up to Psalm 138. Psalm 138. And I've been intentionally saving this psalm for last, although I guess this is my last psalm. We're actually going to continue the summer in the psalm series for the next three weeks. We'll have a guest preacher next week, and then Pastor Charlie, Pastor Josiah, they'll be continuing our summer in the psalms, but... I wanted to save this psalm for last before we do three more and then start another book at the end of August, which if you pay careful attention to this sermon, you might find out what that book is. Um, But also just even want to end on a more personal note is this psalm has just been an incredible encouragement to me as I think about just my own spiritual life and as I think about what God is doing at this church, uh, that this psalm over the last many months has been a great encouragement to my heart, and I want to share why uh, with you this morning. So follow along as I read Psalm 138. Of David, I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul, you increased. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth, and they shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. So there, as you read this psalm, you see things about confidence and purpose. Look at verse 3. On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul, you increased It even has the idea there of boldness. God, you increased my boldness. You increased my confidence. Or then verse 8, kind of the amazing punchline ending of the psalm. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Uh, Remember when we looked at Psalm 88 
and you know, talked about how God it felt like God was constantly destroying him. And we said, I don't think you've ever seen that on Instagram or on like a wall hanging in somebody's house. This verse, on the other hand, seems like it would fit nicely in those places. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. But what I want to ask and what I want us to see is where does that come from? Where does that confidence come from? Where does the boldness come from? Where does this purpose come from? And it doesn't come from somewhere deep within David that he manages to conjure up. It comes from David's view of God. And the main verse that we'll look at this morning, the verse that really drew me to this psalm, and we'll see how it kind of bleeds into all the other parts of the psalm, is verse 2. Look at that again, where David says, I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness, for you have exalted above all things your name and your word. And there's kind of three parts of that second verse that will kind of build our message from this morning. And it all revolves around that final statement. Why is he bowing down? Why is he giving thanks? For God has exalted above all things his name and his word. That is the starting point for all of these other things. David knows that the story of his life is not ultimately about him. It's about the Lord. And even though David was the king, which means that there's a sense in which David was exalted, he knows who the real king is and will always be, the one who is exalted above every name, and that is the Lord. So let's put this down for point number one. If you're taking notes this morning, we need to remember who the real king is. Remember who the real king is is. Do you want purpose? Do you want confidence? I'm assuming the answer is yes. It's going to begin by realizing your life is not ultimately about you. You are not the king. Life is about God because everything is about him. He is the one who is exalted. It says there, for you have exalted above all things your name and your Word And I think you can't really separate those things. You might have a translation that says, or you might notice the footnote in the ESV uh, that says, you have exalted your word above all your name. And if you've got a translation that says that, maybe you're scratching your head and saying, well, what does that mean? How could his word be above his name? I think if that were the right translation, the idea would be that, that David's thinking of some promise. Oh, like, and basically saying, God, you've really outdone yourself this time with this promise that you have fulfilled for your glory. Uh, some scholars think he's talking talking about the Davidic covenant here, but I think this is right. Your name and your word have been exalted above all things, and I want you to see how those things can't really be separated. God's name really represents all that he is. By saying his name is exalted, it's just another way of saying, God, who you are, all that you are, is exalted, and your word is exalted. And you can't separate those things because the reason your word is exalted is because your name is exalted. Just like for an earthly king, the reason why his word, the word of the king is so important is because he is the king. And because God is the king, because his name is exalted, his word is exalted. And that means it's placed above everything. And unless you are placing God and his word above everything, you're not going to know purpose, or confidence. It starts with remembering who the real king is. And we'll focus mostly here on verse 2, but look how this idea of God being exalted comes up again in verses 4 and 5, where it says, All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. Notice how that's echoing some of the same thoughts even of verse 2. There's giving thanks. They've heard the words of of the mouth of God, and they shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. Even that idea of the glory of the Lord is very similar to his name being exalted. He is the king of all kings, and someday all the kings of the earth will give him thanks. We've already seen in Psalms, that's not what's happening right now. Psalm 2, why do the nations rage? Why do the kings of the earth now assemble against the Lord, but all the kings will give him praise. 
And I want you to see how from beginning to end, all of history is pointing to the glory of God. His name and his word are being exalted. Let's go all the way back to creation. How did God create the world? With his word, right? He spoke and it was done, right? Let there be light and there was light. And what does the creation show? Psalm 19 verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. The heavens declare God's glory. Even creation itself as you go outside today, even if it is a bit toasty, it exalts the glory of God as you look and see what he has made. Or look at what it says about Jesus Christ. Listen to what it says about Jesus Christ in Colossians chapter 1. Verses 15 through 17, referring to Jesus, it says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is supreme, he is the king, because all things were created through him and for him. Let's get that straight. You were created through Jesus Christ and for Jesus Christ, not the other way around, okay? And that's what we see in creation, and that's what we see in the end, Right? Even Psalm 2, which is why do the nations rage? It reminds us, as the Lord says about the Messiah, I'm going to make the nations his heritage and the ends of the earth his possession. Or in Revelation 11:15, it says, The kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And since you're here at the nine o'clock service and you haven't been attending the Minor Prophets class, Listen to what it says in Habakkuk 2.14, where it says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And that was an encouraging thought to Habakkuk, because Habakkuk, basically, the story of that book is the prophet goes to God and says, God, look at all the sinful things your people are doing. Why aren't you doing anything about it? And God says, oh, I'm going to send the Babylonians to destroy them, basically. And he's like, whoa, 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 time out. But the Babylonians are worse than we are. God, how does that work, right? And God, as he is telling this prophet, hey, I know what I'm doing. This is one of the things that he says. Hey, whatever happens, as I judge the nation of Israel, as the Babylonians conquer, this is what you can know is going to happen someday. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And then in Revelation chapter 7, we see a great multitude from every tribe, from all over. And what is it that they are singing? A multitude that no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Right? From creation. It was God's word accomplishing it. It was through him and for him throughout history and in the end, God's name and God's word are and will be exalted. That's what it is all about. And all the lies of this world will someday fade away. And I think we can all praise God that that is a good thing. And maybe at this point you're thinking, hey, all of this about God being exalted, that's great. That's all well and good. And I know we should talk about that at church. But can we get back to uh, me having more confidence and purpose in my life? And that's what I'm saying. (laughs) That, that's what I'm trying to show you. That's where purpose and confidence is going to come from when you know it's all about God. It's not about me. And that's what David felt back in Psalm 138, verse 2. We've looked at that ending about that God is exalted above all things, his name and his word. Look at how that verse starts. I bow down. David is the king. 
David doesn't bow down to anybody in this world, but he bows down to the one who is exalted above all things, his name and his word. It is all about God. And bowing down is an act of recognition, an act of submission before this king. So let's put this down for point number two. Joyfully submit to the supremacy of God. Joyfully submit to the supremacy of God. Only when you do that will you even know the purpose for why you exist. Because you were created through him and for him. That's why. I mean, think about it. It's summertime. Some of you, maybe you've already floated the river or that's on your plans for the next month. Or I know any of the guys here go rafting with the other guys in the church last Saturday. Anybody here? Nobody at the night? Or I guess it wasn't a great time if it's just a timid show of hands. Um, (laughs) But what I heard, it was a great time that the men had or as you float the river. But have you noticed when you do those things, you don't really get to set your own agenda? You don't get to show up where everybody's floating the river and saying, but I want to go the other way, right? That doesn't work. Or same with rafting. You don't get to say, well, I'm going to you know, stop here and go here and then, and then travel over to here. No, you're going to go where the river takes you, right? That's kind of the whole point of it. And if you try to have your own agenda and do things your own way, I mean, it's not even going to be any fun, right? That's where even the enjoyment of it comes. When you say, hey, it's not about my agenda, we're, we're going with what, where the river is taking us. And so even on that rafting trip, if the river takes us through rapids, we're going to enjoy that because that's what we're here to do. It's not my own agenda. That's where the purpose, confidence, and joy comes from in those things, Well, you will find purpose and confidence in life only when you give up your agenda for God's agenda. And what is God's agenda? Exalting above all things his name and his word. When that becomes the purpose of your life, right, then you will know purpose. If you think finding that purpose is unlocking some mystery about yourself, you will never find it. The purpose for which we are made is to exalt the name and the word of our Lord. And the kind of people that he lets close to him, it tells us more about that in verse 6. The kind of people that bow before him. Verse 6, for though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly. Those that bow before him, that lower themselves before the Lord, that's who he regards. That's who he allows to approach him. But the haughty... The proud, the arrogant, he knows from afar. Uh, He's distant from them. What kind of person are you? Are you the person that's walking around thinking that your life is all about you? Or are you the person that realizes, no, it's all about God, his name, and his word. Turn with me, please, to the book of Luke. And it'll be different words, but we're going to see how Jesus calls people to discipleship, how Jesus explains this is what it looks like to follow me. Look at Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, and we'll start in verse 23. Jesus says to everyone there, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Jesus right there just told you how to save your life. But he says it's by losing it, by denying yourself, taking up your cross, and following him. That isn't what the popular books on purpose and confidence are saying, right? They're basically making it all about you. Or if they're Christian books, they're basically saying, hey, God's gonna get out there and help you fulfill your dreams. Where Jesus is right here is saying, hey, you know what? Follow me. You're gonna have to give up your dreams because many of your dreams are what I would actually call idols. And that's what you think your life is is all about. Give those things up to follow me and I'll give you life. You'll save your life when you lose your life. 
For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? It's about him and ultimately the coming kingdom of God. Let's turn a little bit later in Luke to verse or to chapter 18 where Jesus meets a young man that seems to be full of purpose and confidence in his life. We, you've maybe heard of him before as the rich young ruler. Luke 18, verse 18, And a ruler asked Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. And he said, all these I have kept from my youth. Good grief. This guy is not short on confidence, right? He is, he is talking to Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. And Jesus says, hey, you know, keep the commandments. And he tells God in the flesh, check, done all that from my youth, right? This guy he, he's, he's bold, but he's looking for boldness. He's finding confidence in the wrong place. Because what does Jesus then tell him to do? When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. I mean, some of the wording is different there, but it's a similar idea. Hey, give up on your life, rich young ruler. Deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad. He lost that confidence, for he was extremely rich. And that was his agenda in life. But that wasn't Christ's agenda for him. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, then who can be saved? But he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And then notice this last part of the chapter is Peter says, see, we have left our homes and followed you. Hey, Jesus, we left our agendas behind to make your agenda our agenda. And Jesus said to them, truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife, or brothers, or parents, or children, for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. Jesus is trying to show the superiority of his agenda. And not just of his agenda, but his kingdom. Because Jesus is a king, and he is bringing with him a kingdom. And he's saying, hey, when you make that the priority of your life, you will not regret it. Give up your lousy dreams for my better ones. Give up your kingdom for my kingdom is what Jesus is saying. But that, again, that's what people, a lot of people really, they think it's about God coming in to prop up my kingdom and to make my kingdom a little bit bigger and better. And that's missing the whole point. It is about the kingdom of God. And that's what I believe David is saying. Hey, I'm here for God. I'm exalting him. I'm bowing down before him. Even if you remember verse one, he says that interesting phrase, before the gods, I sing your praise. What what is that talking about? I thought there were no other gods. Well, some people say, well, actually, I think he's referring to angels there. Some say, well, I think he's referring to foreign kings and rulers there. But I think the right thing is basically the idea is who are David's biggest rivals, his enemies? Well, these foreign kings surrounding Israel that all worship foreign gods. And he's saying, hey, I bow down to God and I'm, I'm ready before all of these foreign kings and their fake foreign gods to praise the one true God who is exalted above all things, his name and his word. And I'm gonna proclaim the glory of that true God over the false idols of this world. And that should be your purpose because it might not look the same as idolatry did in the time of David in our culture, but there's a lot of idolatry going on in our culture. And we need to be those that would rise up in this world today and say, I'm praising the one true God over all of these false gods of the world. My agenda is to promote him, to exalt his name and his word. 
And I want to show you one other example of someone in the Bible that really lived that out. So turn with me to the book we'll be starting at the end of August, the book of Philippians. Go to Philippians chapter 1. See, a couple of you were paying attention there. (laughs) Go to Philippians chapter 1 where we will see the Apostle Paul. And as we'll see more in August, Philippians is known as one of the prison epistles. Because Paul is writing them from Rome where he is imprisoned. And there's some question, will he get out of prison or not? And basically, if the answer is or not, that means he's going to die. He will be executed there in prison. And let's look, well, how does Paul feel about being in such a difficult situation? Well, look at the end of verse 18. You have the ESV, it might almost look like it's just before, find verse 19 and look just before it, where Paul says this, yes, and I will rejoice. How are you feeling, Paul, about being in jail and not sure if you're gonna make it out alive? I'm rejoicing, that's how I'm feeling. Is that what you would be saying in that situation? Is that what I would be saying in that situation? I think we'd realize that'd be a struggle to say that. How in the world is Paul saying that? Verse 19, For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. I'm doing great, guys. I'm rejoicing because the one thing I want is for Christ to be honored and exalted in me. And whether he chooses to do that through releasing me from jail or whether I exalt God by dying as a martyr in jail, I'm rejoicing either way because Christ is gonna be honored no matter what. And that's my whole agenda, guys. Verse 21, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. He's saying, man, if it's up to me, I'm having a hard time deciding whether I would rather die in jail or be released. Because if I die, I get to go be with Jesus. And that's great. That's the best thing, actually. But if I live on, I'm gonna continue to serve you guys, Philippians. And that'll result in your progress and your joy in the Lord. And that will honor Christ. So, You might think I'm in this terrible situation. I'm in a win-win situation is where I am because my only agenda is to honor Christ. And whether I die or whether I live, God is going to accomplish that agenda. My agenda is to serve him. And you see towards the end, he expects, I think what God is gonna do is he is gonna release me so that I can serve you guys some more and come and see you again. But whatever happens, I'm rejoicing. It's a win-win because my agenda is all about Christ. Is that your agenda? Could you honestly say, for to me to live is Christ? Or is for you to live something else? And does that mean you all need to be some imprisoned church planner like the Apostle Paul was? No, but whether you do live for Christ by being a foreign missionary or by being a stay-at-home mom or a real estate agent or a remote tech programmer or a pastor or whether you're married or single or rich or poor, whatever station in life you may be in, you're saying, hey, in this station, I am here to exalt Jesus Christ. That's my whole agenda. It's not to get rich or to have this ideal family or to have this ideal job. No, in my family, in my job, in my life, in my relationships, it's all about Jesus. That's what everything is here for. My purpose is God's purpose. And do you see how that's 
If we go back to Psalm 138 now, do you see how that's basically what David is saying? Let's go back to the last verse of the psalm. And notice carefully the wording, because this is one of those things that, you know, we could just take that first part of the verse out and put it up on, you know, the wall in your kitchen and it would look really nice and sound really good. But look at how it's worded. Psalm 138, verse 8. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Did you notice how that was worded? It doesn't say, the Lord will fulfill my purposes for my life. It says, the Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. But what David is saying here, and what what Paul was saying in Philippians 1 is, that's great. That's literally all I want, is to honor Christ. And I know that God will fulfill his purpose for me, whatever that looks like. And so all the confidence that David has really flows from that knowledge. I mean, look at the next phrase, your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. And if we go back to kind of our main verse, verse two, that middle section that we haven't really talked about yet, he's bowing down toward God's holy temple and he's giving thanks to his name for his steadfast love and his faithfulness. Those of you that have been really paying attention during the Psalms series, notice again those two things that are highlighted in Exodus 34. See how many links there are back to that passage in the book of Psalms, but he is giving thanks. He is thankful like Paul. He is rejoicing even though it's clear he walks, verse seven, in the midst of trouble. But again, he's anticipating deliverance, just like Paul was. Paul even uses that same word. And on the day that he called, verse three, God answered and increased his strength of soul, increased his boldness. Notice there even a contrast with those false gods of verse one. Can those gods answer prayer? Remember Elijah and the prophets of Baal and how he starts taunting them as they're praying to their God? Hey, maybe he went on a trip. Maybe he's using the bathroom. Maybe he's busy and he can't hear you guys. But David says, no, I call to the real God, the God who is exalted. And he answers, and he increases my strength of soul. And all the purpose, all the peace, all the confidence that he has flows from God is exalted. God will be exalted. That's all I want, so I'm good with whatever God does and however he chooses to use me for that end. But if you really look again at verse 8, you see these are pillars to build a confident, purposeful life for you. Where you might say, there's a whole lot about the future I do not know. I don't know what's going to happen. But this is what I do know. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. And the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. God will be exalted in my life or my death. And every day I will experience his steadfast love. I mean, what, what more should we want than that? So let's put this down for our third point this morning. Trust his loving purpose in everything. When we know God is exalted, I, I want to yield my life to that, and he will use me to exalt his name. And so I can trust him and his loving purpose in everything. Because there will not be a day that goes by where I look at something in my life and say, well, God stopped being the God of steadfast love and faithfulness that he said he would be. No, he will always be those things. That does not mean, and I don't mean to imply that that will always be easy for us. I mean, remember Psalm 88 and how that that struggle can be there. And even David here, there is a prayer, the last line of the Psalm, do not forsake the work of your hands. And that's what our prayers are gonna feel like sometimes. God, I know you've promised you will never forsake me, but God, please don't forsake me, right? Right? And really, that's a lot of what prayer is and what prayer should be. You going to God saying, God, this is what you've said. Please do what you've said, God. Because I'm in a tough spot. I'm in a spot where I know this is what you've said, but that's not what I'm seeing in my circumstances. But I do know this is true. So God, please do what you have said. And these are the real bedrocks of authentic confidence and purpose. But you will only get there if, like David Or like the Apostle Paul, you have yielded, submitted your life to the real king, the one who really is supreme. And your agenda is his agenda. 
your agenda in life isn't getting rich or having the perfect family or succeeding in whatever, even though some of those things can be good and important things, the ultimate agenda of your life is I live to honor Jesus Christ and exalt his name and his word. And then you can have that confidence every day. God will fulfill his purpose for me and I will experience his steadfast love. What a confidence that should give us. And again, I mentioned I saved this for last because this has been so encouraging to me and so encouraging as I think about this church. And I hope it encourages you in your life and encourages you even as you think about our church as well. And I hope that really, again, that end of verse 2 there in Psalm 130, 138 is really where a lot of our desires for our church flow from. I mean, even if you take your bulletin out and you flip it over to the back, you'll see the eight distinctives of Compass Bible Church. And really, the heart behind those, so much of it even flows from what David is saying here, that God has exalted above all things his name and his word. That's why at our church, number one, the Bible is central. Because it's God's word that matters. He is the Lord. Forever his truth shall reign. So what does God say? That's what we want to know. And that's why, number two, we showcase expository preaching. We don't want to give up here and give you our ideas and kind of sprinkle some Bible on it. We want to get up here and say what God says through the Bible and let him use us to preach his message. And that's not because, you know, we just bow down and worship the Bible, but it's because the word of God and the name of God are inseparable. And that's really our goals there in numbers three and four. We seek to maintain a high view of God. He is the highly exalted king, not our spiritual therapist, not our spiritual big brother, not, you know, our personal conqueror that's going to help us slay all of our personal Goliaths, right? No, he is the king. And we work to proclaim a biblical gospel. Our job is not to alter the message. Our job is not to make the message something that will sell better in our society. Our job is to deliver the message, the good news that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, that he rose again, that his kingdom is coming, and that everyone needs to repent and believe, right? That's what we want to do because our desire is to exalt his name above all things and his word. And that's really where these other things flow from. We have a genuine reliance on prayer like David did. On the day I called, you answered. My strength of soul, you increased. We want highly committed participants and authentic and sacrificial leaders because we believe this. And we do believe to live is Christ. And that's why we'll always be working to plant new churches to continue to spread the glory of the Lord in anticipation of the day when the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the the sea. So I hope even as we look towards the future of our church, and even here as we kind of take these moments in August where the schedule kind of slows down and we gear up for another, you know, ministry calendar year here at, starting at the end of August, I hope all of us can look towards the future with a lot of confidence, even if we don't know all the particulars. I mean, one thing, we're, we're praying actively for a long-term church home. And we're still here meeting at this middle school. And I'm hoping even within the next month, we should have some things to share once everything's locked down about a new interim location for our church and hopefully even some exciting news about long-term plans for our church. But whatever that looks like, what we can all look at the future and say is the Lord will fulfill his purpose for us and this church. And the steadfast love of the Lord will endure forever. We as a church are in a win-win situation. And we pray that God does not forsake the work of his hands. And so we can have confidence in that, but there's also a challenge for us in that. Does this church exist to exalt the name of the Lord and the word of the Lord above all things? That's the challenge for us, that that would be true, that that would not just be an aspirational statement for our church, but it would be the actual reality of our church. We exist to exalt God's name and God's word above everything. And and that's why we make disciples. The words we use, reaching, teaching, training. We reach people because there are thousands of people around us right here in this valley and billions of people all over the world that they don't know God. 
They don't know his word. They don't know his name. They don't know who he is. And we want to see people reached with the gospel. We want to see people turn from the false, idolatrous gods of this world to find the real name, the real word, the real truth. That's why we want to reach people. It's not so we can grow bigger and feel better about ourselves. It's because of God's glory, God's fame. This is why we teach people to observe all that Christ commanded us. Because the biggest part of sanctification is just less and less living for myself and more and more releasing my agenda for God's agenda. I mean, that's sanctification in a nutshell right there. And that really all comes back to it's about God's name and God's word. It's not about me. And that's why we seek to train and raise up people to be leaders so that they can reach and teach and point people to the Lord who has exalted his name and his word above all things. So the only way we can keep that the main thing for our church is even if that's what we're doing as individuals. Can you honestly say, for to me, to live is Christ? Whatever I'm doing, whether I've got my dream job or I've got no job, whether I'm young and looking towards the future or whether I'm retired and nearing the end, for to me, to live is Christ. That's got to be the main thing for all of us. That has to be the focus of all of our lives. And that reminds us of the promise that Jesus made. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Any of the question marks we have about how God will provide, we know that he will provide for our church. We can know, hey, we're going to seek first his kingdom. We're going to make sure we're busy doing the work of bringing glory to his name by reaching, teaching, training, making disciples. And all these things will be added to us. God will take care of all of our needs. We are in a win-win situation. And so I hope we as individuals can have purpose and confidence. I hope we as a church can have purpose and confidence because our focus is not on ourselves, not on our comfort, not on our agenda, but we have lost all of those things for the greater calling of the exaltation of the name and the word of God. Let's pray together.